here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour. The Axis forces in the Western Desert are now in full retreat. Well, we've got another uh, project to discuss, and that is the, uh, the acquisition of a uh, Marconi R1155 receiver. How did this thing get this side of the pond is the question. How did uh, a receiver that belongs in a British Lancaster or a Halifax bomber come into my shack? Well, it was an accident. Um, you know, these things don't happen every day, but occasionally I trip over something. And uh, over the past 20, 25 years, I, uh, I've had some alien equipment show up in the shack. The first thing was, the, of course, the wireless set 19. And I think I paid $10 for it. It was missing covers, tubes, uh, valves, whatever. And it took a tremendous restoration project to bring it back on the air. But I'm treating this the same way as an alien piece. Um, the original condition of the receiver. Let's take a look at that. The long inspection of the city, which not so long ago housed more than half a million people. I didn't see a single brick or stone building, which wasn't just an empty shell. It was uh, found at a, uh, a very early winter ham fest, a freezing cold day. Uh, it was sitting uh, next to a, uh, a ham radio operator who uh, was just looking for, uh, for someone to take it away. All of the valves had been uh, reportedly uh, burned up when someone applied uh, high, high voltage to the filaments. Um, when we opened the receiver, uh, rat droppings fell out. It was quite a smelly mess. And nobody wanted to touch the receiver. So I told him that if nobody had taken it by the end of the day, I would grab it. So we, uh, we made a little arrangement at the end of the ham fest. And uh, voila! Here it is. It appears to be a, uh, a fairly early design with the original knob, and it has the original dial. But um, when you look at some of the date codes inside, it seems to be a 1954 construction, a 1954 build. So that doesn't make any sense to me. So we need to find out what's the pedigree of this receiver. And uh, as I restore it, You'll be able to go through uh, the whole process with me. I haven't applied power to this receiver yet. Um, as far as the valves go, we're going to go through how to handle uh, replacing the valves in the receiver. And uh, the first step is to get your hands on the uh, the original uh, specification and uh, repair manual for the receiver, which is available online. It's AP two five four eight. A volume one, and it handles both the uh, R1155 and the companion transmitter, the 1154. So we need to get our hands on that first, so that uh, we can start the uh, the restoration process. So we can talk a little bit about the uh, sad situation uh, where all of these beautiful valves have an open filament. Obviously some high tension was put on the uh, filament and every one of them is ruined. That's really too bad. This larger tube is actually a 6V6. Uh, a modification has been done to the receiver and one of the tube sockets has been removed. Uh, one of the tube socket supports has been removed. You can see this one's gone. So they, uh, part of the indicator system in the radio direction finder of the set, uh, that socket was cleaned and uh, this is where the, uh, the final power amplifier tube was put in. That was a 6V6. But unfortunately, his filament is open as well. So now we have to decide with this restoration whether we want to return the set to its original wiring and uh, take all of those audio amplifier uh, added parts out of the set, restore the original socket.
So the dial mechanism on this set is not in bad shape. It looks pretty good actually, uh, but uh, it will need to come apart because uh, we're not getting any effect at all. So that means we're going to have to uh, figure out what's going on. We can talk a little bit about the valves, the tubes, and the early uh, part of the 30s, the, uh, the combined triode heptode was developed with the larger pins and eventually we got to the uh, development of the uh, octal styles. Uh, the X-ray 65 and X-ray 66 represent some early triode heptode uh, frequency changers. Uh, these would develop into the uh, tubes like the uh, the RCA 6K8 and the uh, the VR99 that is used in uh, in the R1155 receiver. Some other nomenclature is uh, 10 echo slash 277 or Charlie Victor 1099. These are all uh, markings that you might find on that frequency changer. Uh, the uh, the mixer type tube. So I I need to find some American equivalents pretty quick for this receiver because uh, the chances of getting a hold of the original uh, British tubes not looking so good. So of course one would be tempted to go right to uh, metal tubes. These are are quite quite prevalent. Uh, this is a six K eight which would be a, a good frequency changer tube for this uh, receiver. But uh, I want to caution, uh, there's a couple of reasons you'll have some problems with the metal tubes. The first is the metal tubes will not go in the sockets. So as you can see, you can't get the, uh, the valve to actually go in without removing the base support, which is this aluminum part here. I don't think we want to do that. If we did, we might run into a different problem. And that problem is that pin 1 on metal tubes is connected to the metal case of the tube. So many times that pin 1 position on an octal socket actually not being connected to the tube in the GT versions and the G versions of the tubes was used as a simple tie point. And there might be a high tension on that or some other sensitive circuit. So when you plug in the metal tube, the first thing that happens is you smell smoke. So you would have to find out if they're using that pin 1 in some some way that you don't know about before attempting to use a metal tube. The other versions are the GT type versions of the tubes. This is a GT, uh, 6K8 GT. As you can see it's shorter and it's octal same problem this tube will not fit it will not go into uh, the socket because of the tube support being a little bit small and made to snugly fit the G version of the valves so the G versions fit through but the GT versions and the metal tubes will not So the substitute I will use for the frequency changer is the 6K8G. So similar we, similarly, we need to talk about the, uh, the RF and the IF amplifiers used in the receiver. This is actually a 6K7 metal. Uh, same issue with the 6K7. You can't use this tube because it won't fit. And pin 1 is likely being used in the set as a tie point. So without modification you can't use a metal tube directly. The other obvious problem of using these shorter metal tubes is the grid caps normally aren't able to reach down far enough to go into these shorter tubes so there would have to be a modification. So I highly recommend that you stay with the original valve style which is the uh, the G versions 
the 6K7G and avoid the 6K7 metal or 6K7GT which are shorter versions of the valve. Uh, the third type we're looking at is the detector uh, which also includes automatic gain control and that is equivalent to a 6Q7 the 6Q7 uh, which is the uh, the VR 101 style in this set has a dual diode and a single triode and we would be looking for a 6Q7G for that position and finally we have the dual triode which is used in the uh, the DF facilities to move the indicator The first aircraft that is going to lead in the early hours of tomorrow morning is turning onto the end of the tarmac to make its takeoff and taking with it perhaps the hopes and the fears and the prayers of millions of people in this country who sleep tonight not knowing that this mighty operation is taking place. There she goes now, the first aircraft leading the attack on Europe. So there's been a little bit of work done on the front panel since we uh, saw the receiver. Uh, when I first got the receiver, of course, it was missing most of the uh, label placards on the front. There were a few that were uh, on the set. Luckily, uh, the volume and uh, band switch and the AVC switch were all there. But I was missing uh, most of the rest of them, including the, uh, the name tag. So uh, I got busy on a uh, program called Canvas, which is an illustration program. Any typical illustration program, you could do the same thing and kind of created the font and the, and the background and printed them out and got the sizing right and uh, got some photo paper. Then I took some ordinary uh, plastic that you normally see in packaging, cut that to shape and uh, put that over the, uh, the labels to protect them and uh, it came out pretty good. Um, originally the receiver had some holes up here and uh, the guy had put a, uh, a binding post here for the antenna. Uh, this control here was being used as a tone control. So the, uh, the R1155 had tone control on it, which is interesting. I'm going to try to turn that into an RF gain control. We'll see if I'll be successful. Also the uh, tuning indicator, which is missing right now, um, had a, uh, a hole next to it, which I've filled with a small variable capacitor, 25 picofarads, which I'm going to make into an aerial trimmer. This is going to go right against the first part of the variable capacitor in the RF gain stage. Um, the sense switch has been sliced off by the former owner, um, so I'm not going to deal with that. And down below we have the uh, placard for the Jones plug and uh, power is the far right hand side. I haven't decided wh whether I'm going to make a plate that covers this or not. I might, I might do that to dress it up a little bit. Here's the existing phone jack that the conversion artist put on the front. It looks pretty interesting. I just left it. And the, uh, the ID tag, uh, not perfect, but good enough to, uh, to pass as an ID tag on the receiver. Uh, cleaned up the heterodyne BFO on off switch. This filter switch I'm not sure how I'm going to use it but we'll come up with a use for that. And X the unknown over here we'll see what we can turn this switch into. I don't even know yet. Uh, you might notice the dial looks a little bit better than it did before. The plastic is no longer rubbing against the the indicator. Um, I actually straightened out the plastic by using a heat gun in my bare hands until I got the plastic flattened out again. And uh, that technique worked. Uh, you just have to be very, very slow and you can bring the, uh, the dial back. Uh, also, did you notice how quiet it is? You don't want that making a lot of noise. And the vernier works now. 
Here's a little test you can do with a vernier. Put it on one of the numbers, like 5 megahertz, for instance, and turn it 10 times to the right. Now turn it 10 times to the left. It should return to the spot that you started at. That's a good test, and you can try that all along the dial. If it can pass that test, you've got a good dial and everything is working uh, properly with the dial. So a little bit of minor paint touch up. I didn't go crazy. I did remove the front uh, and the plastic and gave this a nice coat of crinkle finish and then reassembled it. And I hit a couple spots in the corners where the, uh, the paint had come off. I took the antenna, uh, the homemade antenna plate the guy had with the uh, uh, binding post on it, removed it, hit that with some crackle, and then put a proper SO239 connector on there. I figured that's a kind of an out-of-the-way place for the antenna connector, and that, that'll work for me. Let's take a look at the back of the receiver and uh, see the condition of the set in general. I have cleaned this up a little bit, but uh, even when you're using something like Neverdoll, and uh, Neverdoll is a great thing, to clean up aluminum. Um, most of this is the way I found it and it's simply been wiped clean. A lot of bright metal in here. That tells me that this set never saw a lot of moisture. It never saw um, uh, bad handling and it was stored in a, a somewhat uh, good place. There is some pitting back here. We can see the pitting. but. When you see shiny uh, cans like this, uh, it tells you that uh, this thing's in pretty good shape. Also, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a date code. There's a date code. Look at this. 453. 4-1953. What the heck were they doing building these receivers in 1953? You know, w this is a wartime receiver. So they must have had some use for this after the war, and up past the Korean War even. So the back of the SO239, I've installed a piece of uh, double shielded coax. That's going to go down to the band switch. This is the original antenna lead, which I'm going to remove. Here's the leads off the antenna trimmer, which are going to come over to the variable capacitor. And, uh, you know... I've got a plate here I've got to replace that goes uh, over the BFO compartment. So there's still some work to do. You can look in here and you can see where that 6V6 was put in. That's where the 6V6 goes, the audio output stage that was added by the former owner. Take a peek at the bottom of the set. Okay, here's the, uh, the RF uh, section of the receiver. The plate has been removed so we can see the uh, the band switching arrangement with all the trimmers. Now this is the plate that came off. Very shiny. Um, again, this set, even though it was full of uh, mouse droppings, it smelled absolutely horrible. Nobody wanted to even get near this receiver at the ham fest, to my delight. And uh, after we got all of that out of it and uh, sprayed it with Lysol and cleaned it up, what is revealed is a fairly good looking set underneath. Here's the added audio output transformer. There's a lot of soldering that's been done by the uh, conversion ham. You know, there's some missing connections here. Some of these were probably published mods, and some of them were crea creativity on his part, but I think he did a pretty good job. Um, all of these tube sockets have been cleaned. I went in there with a Q-tip and removed all the waxy buildup on those tube sockets just good practice to get rid of all the grime because you could have some leakage uh, on those uh, phenolic uh, tube sockets. I give the grade of this receiver as uh, high commercial. It's not uh, typical of, of military construction, but it's certainly high commercial construction and uh, certainly appropriate for its uh, job in the in the bombers, the uh, Lancaster and Halifax. It's, uh, it's going to survive those missions in World War II that it was designed to survive. Um, very, uh, a very good use of commercial parts 
in a military receiver. So the next thing you're probably wondering is how much did I pay for this receiver? Well, I'm not going to go there, but I'm going to tell you that it was probably 10 times less than I should have paid for it. But that's just the way things go when you trip over something at a hand meet. You never know when a good deal is going to be struck. Some of you are saying that uh, I'm not going to be able to do much with this receiver because I don't know anything about it. And you're absolutely right. It's an alien piece. Just about everything about this receiver is unknown to me. So I'm starting from scratch, just like anyone who uh, lays eyes on uh, a piece of equipment for the first time. I'm going to be learning right along with you in these videos. And we're starting out at ground zero with the receiver. In the next video, we're going to actually get into the nuts and bolts of bringing the stages up one at a time troubleshooting and alignment and getting the receiver back on the air so that we can use it uh, on the shortwave bands. So I hope you've gotten something out of this first video on the 11, uh, the R1155 receiver. Um, we haven't even fired it up yet. All we've done is the prep work and uh, we're going to be working on uh, the actual uh, stages of the receiver next, going through the troubleshooting process, the bring up procedure, and the final alignment so that we can bring this baby back on the air.